So some of you here today, this might have been your first time seeing or experiencing a child dedication. And this is a unique part of our faith that maybe looks different than other faiths or other religions. And it's an opportunity for us to, as we've talked about, as Pastor Dan shared, we want to dedicate these children to the Lord. We want to be as a church family to come alongside these parents. And so this may be a unique experience, a different experience for you. But I also want to just kind of take a step back for a moment and, and look at the bigger picture of Christianity and ask you this question. Maybe you thought about it before. Maybe it's been asked of you before. It's what makes the religion of Christianity different than any other religion there is in the world? What makes our religion unique? Now, I think this is a common question that, that many of us have had to think about, had to ponder, have been faced with the reality of why it is unique or even if it is unique. We live in a culture today where the idea of religions being able to kind of weave their way and work their way together and that they can, quote unquote, coexist with one another is a very common thought within our day. Well, maybe you've had some answers to that question before, but uh, I've thought about it before. I've had conversations with people about it before, but I love what this one pastor, his name is David Platt. He, in a one-minute video, gives us this answer in a way of telling a story about his interaction with a couple of people. So go ahead, take a look at his one-minute answer on the screen. I was in another country recently and I was sitting outside a temple with uh, two other guys actually from different religions. They were talking about how all three of our religions were fundamentally the same, just kind of superficially different. Finally, I just I, I spoke up and I said, it's almost like you guys picture God or whatever you want to call him at the top of a mountain. And we're all at the bottom of a mountain. I may take this path up and you may take this path up, but in the end, we'll all be in the same place. And they smiled and they said, exactly, you understand. I looked back at them and said, well, what if I told you that the God at the top of the mountain didn't wait for us to find our way up to him. He actually came down to where we are. And they said, well, that would be great. I said, this is the difference. What we find in the Bible is the story of a God who has not left us alone to try to find our way to him. He has come to us and he has made the way to himself through Jesus that quick summary and it maybe doesn't answer the, the question in, in it's all of its glory and theological robust truth, but it gives us a quick summary, a quick picture of what sets Christianity apart from any other religion. It's that our God, the God of the universe, came down to us in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, that he willingly gave up his perfect life and he died on the cross to take the punishment from for my sin, for, for your sin. And that he rose again three days later to overcome the, the power of sin and the rule of Satan in our lives so that you and I could be restored, be reunited with God in eternity. But it's not just in eternity. It's that we can have a personal relationship with God right now through faith in Jesus Christ. God came down to us. We, we can't earn it. We don't deserve it. There's nothing good inside of us that would ever get us to that place of being in that perfect relationship. It's all because of what God did through Jesus. And now his spirit, the Holy Spirit, can live in us, can reside in us, can help us live in a way that honors God and glorifies him. This is the unique, this is the difference in our faith versus any other faith. And for many of you here this morning, you've received that by faith. You've believed in that truth. You have this relationship with Jesus. And for some, it's just so simple. Like everything else says you got to work your way up to your relationship with God. But Christianity says God came down to us. Like it's a simple concept. It's a simple idea. And yet sometimes the simplicity of that can get in the way of receiving that and feeling that. Or sometimes the simplicity in that can get in the way of us sharing this really good news with those around us. Sometimes the simplicity of it causes in our hearts, those that have already made that decision, a little bit of judge judgmentalism, a little bit of skepticism. Like, ooh, are they really ready to receive this? Like, did they really make that decision? Because I don't know, I see how, what they post. 
I see what, how they live, I see how they talk, and I don't really know if it's really made the difference. And we, we, we sometimes, the simplicity of this message, we make it so complex and we add on our own things to it and it misses the point of what God has done. I don't know if you felt that way before, maybe you've experienced that before, but I'm here to tell you this morning, you're not alone. Our guy Jonah He was in the same predicament. He was in the same boat as we sometimes feel in our lives today. And so as we continue on in our series through the book of Jonah, we're going to see Jonah faced with this reality once again. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. There's Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you want to grab that and turn to page 754, you'll find it there, 754 as well. Feel free to pull out your devices and pull up your Bible app on your phone, your tablet, whatever you have. Our verses will be up on our screens throughout our time together this morning. And as you're turning there, just want to remind you that here at Avenue, we're going to teach from God's Word every week because we believe God has primarily spoken to us through his word, the Bible. And not only do we believe God's word to be true, but that it's very applicable to our lives today. So, so far in this story, we've, we've covered a lot. The first two chapters, Jonah received a call from God to go to a people, the Ninevites, a part of the Assyrian Empire. We're about 750 BC within our world history. And he's going to give them a message to repent, to turn away from their evil behaviors and to turn back to God. Jonah wants nothing to do with it. So he goes the opposite direction and he gets in a boat, tries to sail away. The boat begins to face this enormous storm. Jonah realizes that it's God sending the storm. And so the sailors throw him overboard. Last week we saw Jonah was swallowed by a fish and he kind of repents, but not really. Kind of a sorry, not sorry type of relationship with God. And, but God forgives him and he goes back on land. And so this map up on the screen you see is where we have there on the right, where it says Gath Heifer. That's where Jonah came from. He was supposed to go to Nineveh. Instead, he went down to Joppa, and he was going to sail all the way to Tarshish. But he didn't get that far. He, but he barely made it, as you can see on that map, a little bit across the Mediterranean Sea. So now he's back on land. He's in Joppa. He's near his hometown. And now he's about to head to Nineveh. And that's where we're at right now. Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Here's what it has to say. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And so Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city and it took three days to go through it. So let's throw that second map up on the screen here. Now Jonah He was there in Joppa, and now he's got to just go a little bit northeast to Nineveh. Now, sometimes when you look at a map, it's hard to understand, like, the scale of it, how big it is. So from Joppa all the way to Tarshish, where he was going to go across the Mediterranean Sea, is going to be about 3,000 miles. For him to go from Joppa up to Nineveh was about five, 600 miles. So it doesn't seem like too long of a trip, right? You could take a four-hour flight and get there. So it's not that big of a deal. But in a culture without trains, without cars, without airplanes, in a culture where most people would walk about 25 miles a day, that's about the max that you could go, and then you'd get up and go the next day, about 25 miles of walking. It would take someone about a month, three to four weeks, to go about five, 600 miles. So Jonah's got a little bit of time on his hands, right? He's got a month to think about what God is going to have him to do. But not only that, like this is a physically demanding task that was before him. So first off, let's talk about the spiritual task before him. Then we'll talk about the physical task. So the spiritual task is you're going to this great city, the city of Nineveh, to a people that have become the great empire of the day by slaughtering, killing, enslaving tons of different people groups. Like that, that's, that's how they rose to power. That's how the Assyrians became great. And so Jonah's supposed to go to them and tell them, hey, what made you great is actually terrible. So you need to stop doing that. And, and not only that, then you need to turn and trust in the Hebrew God, the God of Israel, the one true God of the universe, because he's telling you not to do what you've been doing. Like, 
they have no regard for this Israelite God. They probably have no regard for the Israelites. We know about 30 years later, the Ninevites just, or the Assyrians destroy the nation of Israel. They had their own gods they worshiped. They had their own leaders that they worshiped. And so Jonah is going to people who don't care about his God and is trying to tell them, hey, what has made you great? You have to stop doing. Like from an emotional, spiritual standpoint, you have a month of just thinking about what's going to happen to you as you're about to do this, like that's got to be a hard walk. That's got to be a difficult walk. But not only that, it's physically demanding. Like a lot of times we can take on emotional stress in our lives, but then when you add in the physical stress, it just takes it to a whole nother level. And this is where Jonah's at. Not only does he have to go on this month-long walk, but then he goes to Nineveh. And it takes him three days to kind of get around the entire city. So throw up this picture of the city of Nineveh. You'll see this is, you know, it's kind of made by Archaeology Illustrated. So it's not like a, a picture of it, you know, 2,500 years ago. But what you see there in the town center is where most people resided. And then if you look kind of off in the back, there's these high walls. And this was very typical of a city back then. They would have these high walls that would be a way to fortify their defenses. They would have soldiers there stationed on those walls and they would be used to make sure that no enemies could come in. And so these, these giant walls wrapped around the entire city. But that's just the inner part of the city. What most cities of this day, they expanded outside of their walls. And so the city, quote unquote, of Nineveh was, almost felt like a, a, a city that kind of took on a bunch of different suburbs, if you'd like to call them that. So most scholars would estimate that the circumference of the city of Nineveh was about 50 miles. So if you, if you start on the outside, you make a circle around the entire city, not just the inner city, but everything is about 50 miles. So picture in your mind the city of Chicago. And if you started, you know, in the, the north East part of it, you'd be a little bit Lake Michigan, 25 miles, but you make a, a circle all the way around the city of Chicago, right here in the western suburbs, you would probably catch the outskirts of it. And you just keep drawing the circle all the way around the city of Chicago. That's Nineveh. It's huge. And he's got to go to different people talking to him and tell them this message. He's got a lot to do. This is a emotionally and spiritually exhausting task, but this is also a physically exhausting task. I mean, picture this in your mind for a moment. If you were living in Nashville, you grew up in the South and, and you were told by God, hey, I want you to go to those heathens in Chicago. They are terrible people. They yell at each other in traffic. They show each other their fingers in traffic as well. I'm not sure what that's all about. You'll figure it out when you get there. I want you to go there and you need to tell them to change their behaviors. They're just, they're mean. They're cruel. You should see how they treat their sports teams. They just are so mean to them and they complain about them all the time. You're like, wait a second. I could get on, I could drive my car and go to the coast of Florida or somewhere in the South and have sunny beaches. Instead, I got to go up here where there's four seasons like every day. You know, have you seen that? There's four seasons every day. You got the morning, afternoon, you go, wait. And you're telling me I have to go there and I have to talk to these people that aren't nice and their accents are funny and weird and I have to give them a different message. Like, I don't know about you. If I was Jonah, this would be one of the top two jobs that I would never want to have. I, I just say, this does not sound fun at all. And yet this time around, after trying to run away, and getting swallowed up by a fish and spit up on land, he finally decides to go. And in verses four and five, we see what happens. Verse four, it says this. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city. That's the, the inner city. It's, you know, the downtown Chicago. Proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. This, this is crazy, right? He goes in and he tells them that they're going to get destroyed and they believe. They repent. They turn away from what had made them this great empire of, in the known world and decide to believe in Jonah. 
Now, most scholars would agree that what he said here in verse 4, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Like, that's not the only thing he said. He didn't go around with like a bell just saying, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Like, most likely he told them a little bit about his story, who he was, who his God was. And, and the Ninevites would know. There was close enough proximity to Israel that they would know some of these things about the Israelites' God. But the response was crazy. Like it was instantaneous. And it's not like Jonah was this great preacher communicator. I mean, the reason that you see this one sentence summary that doesn't talk about, you know, the power of God, God's love, his desire for your repentance, his desire for you to turn from your evil. Like you don't see any of that here in the description. It, it, it alludes to the fact that how Jonah proclaimed this message wasn't the most articulate. He wasn't the expert theologian or the great Billy Graham evangelist, all right? He didn't have a million followers on IG and everyone was looking at his reels, okay? Like, he was not the best. He went there maybe a little bit stubborn, maybe a little bit frustrated that he still had to do this and to share this truth with the city of Nineveh. But they changed. They believed. That word there, believed, and in verse Five, the Ninevites believe God. It's a word that we see used throughout the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the, the first 39 books of our Bible were originally written in the Hebrew language. And we see that word believe come up quite often. One of the first times that it comes up is in Genesis 15, where God is talking to Abraham. And he says, hey, I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna give you a great nation, but you have to trust me. You have to leave your hometown. You have to get out of here. And it says, Abraham, believe God and God credited it to him as righteousness, that he was in right standing. He was in a right relationship with God. Then you see that word believed used throughout the Old Testament in a negative way to describe the nation of Israel and how they didn't believe God and how they, they chose not to believe what God was going to give them, the, 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 the land that he had promised for them. And time and time again, they chose to reject God and not believe but then we even see, as we've talked about a couple times in this series, Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus himself, when he's talking about his miraculous death and resurrection to come, he references the repentance of the Ninevites. That they chose to turn away from what they were doing and turn towards obedience and trust in God. This was a legitimate belief. This was a death to life transformation in that moment for so many people in the city. Like what they were doing here in verse five, they were fasting, they put on sackcloth. This would have been a common expression of people who were mourning, who were grieving, who were crying out to their deity for things to change. This wasn't just they're putting on a show. Like their hearts were truly transformed in that moment. And seeing that sudden transformation, sometimes when we, we see it in Scripture, it's one thing. But sometimes when we see it in our own lives, start to get a little bit skeptical of it. I know for me, as a, as a 33-year-old, I, I've grown up in the church my entire life. And I, I've seen, you know, you know the, the, the emotionally driven summer camps for students where everyone's making a decision for Christ, everyone's crying and tears are flowing and everyone's a Christian that, that day or for that week. Or we've, we've grown up in a culture where, you know, you have revivals that happen and you just see thousands of people raising their hands. You have these altar calls and, and preachers are up here saying, no, nope, there, there's more people. I, I sense that there's more coming to Christ. I need to see more hands raised. And, and you see this. And so like for my generation, even generations coming behind me, Generation Z, there's this sense of skepticism when it comes to these emotionally driven transformations. Now, I'm not to say they're all terrible. I, I've, I personally have had a couple of experiences while at a camp where God you know, transformed my life, brought me from death to life, showed me a different path I needed to take in my life. So I've experienced them. And yet at the same time, I have this skepticism toward them, like, is that really, did 3,000 people really trust in Jesus that day? Like, did that really, like, that's, that's my heart. That's where it's at. 
Because I'm like, you know, I, I know the speakers. They're really good speakers. They can, they can draw on emotions. They know what to say, how to say. You got the lights. You got the fog. You got all these different things. You got the experience. When you got 50,000 people in a stadium, yeah, you kind of want to join in with everyone who's going down on the field and, 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 and making this decision. So I, that's where my mind is at. That's not what's happening here at all. Jonah doesn't have any lights. <laughs> he, he's not an articulate preacher. He doesn't have the fog. He doesn't have the great worship band. He doesn't have, you know, the captive audience. He's going around to a city that wants nothing to do with him and his God and giving a message half-heartedly, and they're changing. Like, this could only be because of the work of God, the work of his spirit in their lives. And so regardless of how you feel about some of those things, maybe you're a little bit more skeptical like I am. Maybe you're on the other side and you're like, no, God's working, God's moving. We believe it. Anywhere in between, no matter where you're at this morning, I think what can happen sometimes, and I'm guilty of this as well, is that then we, we hold back the simple good news message because we're skeptical of the work of God. Like what we're doing is we're telling God, I don't know if you can really make that change. I don't know if that person's really ready to receive your grace and forgiveness. I don't know if your Holy Spirit could make that transformative work in their life, just like you've done in my life. I don't think they're ready where I'm at just yet. Like that's what we're saying. We may not think we're saying that. We may not say we're saying that, but that is what we're saying. Like God can work in how Ever he wants to work, whenever he wants to work. And he can work in the most powerful and amazing ways. And on the other side of that, if you're here with us this morning, you're watching online, maybe you're not a follower of Christ. And you're skeptical of some of these things too. Or maybe you thought to yourself, well, I, I gotta kind of get my act together. I gotta get things figured out. I don't feel like I, I, I got to clean myself up a little bit more and then God will love me. Then God will forgive me. I got to make sure I start going to church or doing A, B, and C and then, then I can kind of take this religion thing seriously again. Well, that, that's not what we're talking about here in Christianity. <laughs> Christianity says you can't get yourself dressed up. You can't work your way. You can't do A, B, and C. You will always fall short. You're going to try to climb that mountain to God. You will fail time and time again. But guess what you need? You need someone who's going to put you on your back, who's going to carry you up the mountain. And that's only God through faith in Jesus. And so if you're there this morning, I want to encourage you that you're part of a group of people that are saying, hey, we're not perfect. We've fallen short. We don't get things right. Sometimes we make things too complex too, but that you are welcomed here and that you can believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I, I love how Paul, the Apostle Paul, summarizes it, this simple good news message in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. These are great verses. Memorize these verses. These are awesome. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this. For it is by grace, which is something that you don't deserve, but you get. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is believing in something to be 100% true in your life, even if you've never seen it with your own eyes. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That message was true for the Ninevites. That message is true for us today. That's only by God's grace. It's only by our faith in him that we can be saved. And so here's my challenge for us as we wrap up our time this morning. Is how can you and I have a faith like the Ninevites? The, the enemies here, right? The, the great Assyrian empire, the ruthless empire that was just terrible towards everyone. How can we have a faith like theirs? Well, I think for the Christian and non-Christian, I'm going to talk to both of us here in this moment. And so first for the Christian, as well as for the non-Christian, here it is. Number one is this, is I'm not ready. Or you're not ready. We sometimes say, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to believe. Or we sometimes say, oh, you're not ready. <laughs> They're not ready to believe. And sometimes we think that about ourselves. 
That's sometimes the first obstacle of overcoming our lack of faith. And we want to have a faith like the Ninevites. And I think there's a verse that really speaks to this. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 38. This is such a cool thing. Jesus has recently died. He's rose again. He's gone back to the Father in heaven. And he's then, Peter is then giving this message. They've received the Holy Spirit. And look what Peter has to say to all these Jewish people that are listening. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. They, were, they couldn't believe it. They were overwhelmed with grief because the Messiah that they had been waiting for for years that they had read about in their Old Testament scriptures, they killed. They put on the cross. It was their fault that they did it all. And Peter's telling them that. And they're cut to the heart. And they said, brothers, what shall we do? In verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He tells them the same thing that Jonah told the Ninevites, repent, turn away, trust in Jesus. And that last one, be baptized. See, we see throughout scripture, especially in the book of Acts, that when someone makes a decision to trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, their first act of obedience is to be baptized. And what we mean by baptized is that someone would be immersed underwater as a representation of Jesus dying on the cross and being buried. And that they would be brought back out of the water as a representation of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. They're, 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 it's their own symbolic death to life experience. A lot of times we summarize baptism here by saying this. It's an outward proclamation of an inward transformation. We are proclaiming to everyone here in our church family that we believe that Jesus died and rose again. That that is, that is solidified in our hearts, that we have his spirit inside of us as a seal that, that God will never leave us or forsake us, as it says in Hebrews chapter 13. And so for some of you here this morning, if you're at that place, you've made that decision no matter your age and stage of life, God's word calls us then to publicly proclaim that by being baptized. And we have some people at our church that we're excited. We've had those conversations with them and, and they're gonna be making that decision too and proclaim their faith to their church family. And similar to child dedication, when, when we baptize someone, we support that person. We encourage them in their faith journey. We're saying, hey, you're part of the family. You're gonna be with us and we're gonna help you grow in your faith. And so maybe that's where you're at this morning. I want to encourage you. You got some family members who are going to be baptized here soon. On Sunday, November 20th, we're going to have a baptism service here at our church. Well, some other things that we'll be sharing, but we have some people that are already scheduled saying, yes, I want to get baptized. And we're going to do it on that Sunday. And so that's where you're at this morning. I would encourage you on that connect card, on the bottom portion of that, there, there's a little circle in there that says, I, I would like to be baptized. I want more information about baptism. Circle that circle in, pencil it in, tear it off, drop it off in the offering boxes on your way out. I will personally talk to you this week and hear why you want to be baptized. I'm not going to coerce you into it. I'm not going to force you into it. But I want to hear what God's doing in your life because I believe the Holy Spirit can work instantaneously. He's powerful. He can work. And for those of you that are Christians, you've made that decision, you've been baptized. What's holding you back from sharing that message with others? What's holding you back from even doing the simple thing of just inviting them to church or inviting them to join you in your small group, your Bible study? Well, maybe this is the second obstacle that you can relate to. You're thinking that you're not ready. Throw up that second one up on the screen. It's this, it's I don't know, or I don't know what to say or do. So sometimes for the non-Christian, we say, well, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm ready. I have a lot of questions. I need everything to line up with how I think in order for me to believe first. And it's like, mm, wait a second. <laughs> You're never going to understand everything in here. If you did, that would make you God. <laughs> and that's never going to happen. I can guarantee you that. And so if you have questions, well, guess what? We have a place for conversation. We have a, a place to hear those questions 
I love talking with people. We have pastor staff, ministry leaders, ministries that love answering questions, just talking through, and we don't always have the answers. One of the best answers I love to give to people when they ask a question about something here in the Bible is, I don't know. I don't know. But hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do some research. I'm going to go back and read this a little bit more. I love to further the conversation. But don't let your questions be a hindrance to you stepping forward in faith and believing in Jesus Christ and being baptized. And for the Christian, sometimes we say, I don't know what to say or do. I don't know what to say to this person. Or I, I'm going to get tongue tied and, and, and I'm going to start over my words and I'm going to mess it up. But I'm going to do something I shouldn't have done. And they're going to be complete. It's going to be all my fault. It's like, no, no, no. God can work in spite of you. God works in spite of me. God works in spite of all of us. He worked in spite of Jonah. Remember our great prophet Jonah? 40 days and you'll be destroyed. 40 days. and you're Like, really? Like that? That real? That's, that's the next Billy Graham right there, right? You know, that's the next Instagram preacher, right? He was awful. He was terrible. And yet God worked in a mighty way. So don't be afraid to have to share because God will supply the word and the action that you need. And I'm not just saying that because I'm saying it. It says it here in his word. Jesus himself says it. Mark chapter 13, verse 11. He's talking to his disciples about this very thing. Verse 11, he says this. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, They're arrested and brought to trial because they're professing their faith in Jesus. They're being persecuted. He says, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit speaking in you. So don't worry. The Holy Spirit's got it. He knows what he's doing. So at this time, we're going to move into a time of reflection. We're going to take communion together. In a moment, one of our elders, Oliver Vane, is going to lead us in taking communion. The worship team is going to come out and they're going to sing a song over us. It's a song that we've sung a couple times in this series called Jonah's Prayer. And it, it takes to heart some of the words that were in chapter two of what we covered last week. And we, we learned that maybe Jonah's heart wasn't fully repentant in that moment. But these words can be powerful words of repentance and confession for you. If you're at a place today where you want to make that decision to trust in Jesus. You can declare that to him in your own words. If you feel God's spirit tugging on your heart, then declare that to him today. The thoughts that you think in your mind, God hears those thoughts. So have a conversation with him. And for those of us that have believed, we're about to take communion that represents Jesus' death and resurrection. Here's a great opportunity to come to him asking for forgiveness. Have you been too skeptical? Have you been too judgmental? Have you forsaken your call to share this simple good news message with others for whatever reason? Now is your opportunity to confess that, ask for forgiveness, and believe that he will forgive you. So I want you to take this moment now. Talk to God, listen to the words, believe that he's speaking and working in your life. Let me pray for us as we enter into this time. Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for hearing us today. Thank you for speaking to us. We ask God in this moment, the moments ahead, that we would come to you with an open heart to whatever it is you want us to receive today. We love you. And we ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.